Will you please pray with me for a moment? Holy and loving God, you gather us in from our different walks and paths and busyness for this time of prayer and song and reflection and nearness to you. We feel your spirit always and already moving among us, but we pray your particular blessing on the moments ahead. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So a few years ago, I went to visit one of my college friends who was living in Brooklyn, in New York. And I was there for maybe like three days, and I think we managed to see every single park and museum and restaurant and thing of note in like the whole city. And I know that's kind of crazy because there's a lot going on in Brooklyn, but by the end of those three days, my legs were numb and the past 72 hours were a total blur. And so not a lot stands out to me from that trip because we just did so much. But there is one or a couple things I remember and one among them was our trip to the Brooklyn Museum, which I had never been to before and which is just truly spectacular. We saw a lot of different things, different kinds of art there. And one thing we saw was this installation, exhibit, piece of art by a woman named Judy Chicago. And it's the dinner party. And there's some smiles, so maybe some people have seen this piece of art before, I see some nods. But it's this massive table, this triangular table in, in the middle of a huge room. And on this table are 39 different place settings. And each place setting is crazily unique. It's this kind of, it's a plate, but it sort of defies the definition of a plate. It's this piece of ceramic or pottery that is vaguely plate shaped, but stunningly beautiful. And there's place settings that are unique to each, each place at the table. And they're done with quilting or tapestry work or embroidery, all different types of handicrafts. And each place setting is dedicated to a woman in history somebody who played a role in the way history or culture or art or technology or science was shaped, but somebody who in the 1970s when Judy Chicago put this piece together was likely not really mentioned in history books, was not given the credit for the role that she played. And so Judy Chicago, she took this idea of a dinner party, which for us in a, in a time in a world where we don't have a lot of you know, ballroom dances or calling cards, is kind of one of the last outcroppings of manners, of the place where there are strict rules about who is invited and who sits where and how we show honor and respect. She took this and she turned it on her head and she used this notion of a dinner party to instead honor the people who had been left out, to instead place at the table those who hadn't been invited. And she went even farther than this because the crafts that she used to set the table, those tapestries and embroideries and the pottery work, were these crafts that were traditionally and are traditionally done by women that are seen as domestic. That art museums, especially in the 1970s, didn't feature in their exhibitions. They didn't have a quilting exhibit because that was just something that was done in the home. It was nice and it was cute, but it wasn't art. And Chicago takes all of this and she turns it on her head on its head, and she presents to us an image of a dinner party far more expansive and inclusive than what culture was given to her. She takes this image of a dinner party and she kind of explodes the rules around who is respected, around what is honored. And she presents for us a dinner party far more welcoming far more in step with love and honor and respect as we now know it and honor it than what was around her. And so she created this piece of art that even, what, 50 years later was still touching and impactful to a 20-something who got to see it. This piece of art that revolutionized feminist art in 1970s art that is still talked about, that is still remembered today. And I think it's probably pretty obvious why this piece of art, the dinner party, came to mind for me when I was thinking about this passage because Jesus is at a dinner party. He's at a dinner party on the Sabbath, and it's a dinner party that is just as concerned with manners as most of the formal dinner parties that we attend. And Jesus even kind of launches in to this 
exhortation on manners. Jesus says, now don't sit at the head of the table in the place of honor because what if there's somebody who comes, who ranks above you, and then you might have to move to the bottom and it'll be really embarrassing. And make sure that you invite people not just out of your own blatant self-interest, that also isn't a great look. And Jesus gives these manners in a way that for me feels kind of surprising because this whole journey through the Gospel of Luke, we've been confronted with a Jesus who doesn't really fit with our idea of manners. A Jesus who tells us things that are unsettling, a Jesus who is always ruffling feathers, and then all of a sudden Jesus offers these seemingly conventional advice on how to behave in public, how to make friends and influence people. And when I was reading this piece of scripture and reflecting on it and reading other commentaries, I learned that actually these ideas aren't even novel to Jesus. That these ideas are common ideas, common manners, common teachings in the ancient world that have been circulated, that Jesus would have been exposed to as a young child, that Jesus' audience would have been familiar with. And for me, something that stuck out and was surprising was that there were manners guides circulating in the ancient world. It just seems like maybe they had other things they had to be concerned about back before running water and electricity. But no, people had the time and cared enough to circulate guides on how to behave and how to comport oneself in public. And maybe that shouldn't be surprising to me because manners guides have popped up throughout our history, throughout our history as a country. Um, I don't know if any of you have looked at George Washington's rules of civility that he copied as a 14-year-old. It's kind of this endearing uh, little chapter in American history where our founding father, as a teenager, a 14-year-old, took the time to copy out 110 rules of civility, ideas about manners, how to control himself in public, how to behave at parties or in intimate settings. And they're kind of silly if you get to read them. I'll just read a couple of them for you. Let your countenance be pleasant, but in serious matters, somewhat grave. The gestures of the body must be suited to the discourse you are upon. Reproach none for the infirmities of nature, nor delight to put them that have in mind thereof. And so you can just picture this earnest 14-year-old George Washington taking the time to copy out by hand 110 of these, and those are some of the shortest. I had never actually really heard of George Washington's Rules of Civility until I read this book, which is called The Rules of Civility. It's by Amor Towels, and I, I picked it up because I, like everybody else in the country, it seems, really fell in love with a gentleman in Moscow, and so I wanted to read more. And this story is different. I laughed less than I did at a gentleman in Moscow, but I still recommend it. It's a novel that's about manners. Um, it's about a young woman living in New York in the 30s and the 40s, and she's coming up from nothing, the daughter of an immigrant from Russia, and she's trying desperately to make a life for herself. And it's about her brushes with elite and wealthy society. It's about her grappling with her own identity and what she cares about and what she's willing to tolerate and what she's not willing to tolerate. And in this book, it's named The Rules of Civility because a central character that she encounters is an adherent to these rules of civility. In fact, he keeps a copy of that in his apartment and it's annotated and underlined and is clearly a dear book to him. And this character who is an adherent to the rules of civility, he is the picture of manners. It's a delight to read about this character because he's one of those people who always knows the right thing to say and he knows the right time to extend a hand or open a door or offer a drink. It's like, he is a ballerina in a ballet that the rest of us are just lumbering through. And so our protagonist is totally impressed by this man and his rules of civility. He epitomizes good manners and he puts everybody else at ease. But there's a point in the novel where she discovers something about this man, and I won't go into detail because I, I don't wanna spoil it, but it makes her think that maybe those good manners don't run quite deep enough. It makes her wonder if those good manners are just a facade that he puts on that's hiding something, that rings a little bit hollow, that feels a little bit unauthentic. And for her, it really unsettles this relationship that is so dear to her. For her, it opens her eyes that maybe good manners aren't quite enough and that maybe good manners, when they're not founded on a bedrock, 
of truth and authenticity, of care and honesty, when good manners aren't rooted in goodness, that maybe they're actually a little bit hollow and maybe they're actually a little bit rotten. And it's an example from a fun novel that I think you all should take the time to read, but I think it rings true a little bit more deeply than that, that good manners aren't necessarily in step with the good news that we as Christians celebrate each and every week, hopefully each and every day. That good manners aren't necessarily good news. I think about our scripture passage, where sure Jesus starts off with kind of this litany of manners that would have been very familiar to anybody reading that aren't particularly groundbreaking, but he goes farther than that. Jesus tells us and his listeners that when you host a dinner party, you're not just to invite those who will serve your own self-interest. You're not just to invite your friends and your rich neighbors and your brothers and the people who might be able to feed you in return, but no, you should invite the most marginalized, the people who have the least to give as far as bread and food and money. You should invite those who no one would ever think of including. And in Jesus' day, he names those folks as the crippled, as the poor, as the blind, as the lame. The people who were often cast aside, who were almost always looked over. Now this, for Jesus' hearers, would have been anything but good manners. These wouldn't have been the people who one honored according to cultural norms or one showed respect to. When Jesus offers this piece of good news, Jesus is flying in the face of good manners. Because good manners is not necessarily good news. We see it in scripture, and I think a lot of us have felt it in our communities, in our families, in our relationships. I grew up in a church not too far from here, which I still deeply, deeply love and feel connected to. And I remember when I was a child, I'm maybe like 10 or eight, um, there was a conversation about inviting a group of folks from a nearby adult assisted living community to come and worship with us. And these folks, um, it would have necessitated organizing rides because these folks couldn't drive. And there was also some conversation about whether or not it might change how worship felt. Because the people who were gonna come would be folks who had a lot of accessories with them. People were in motorized wheelchairs, they had oxygen tanks. And I remember as a kid, I was helping putting out banana bread or something for coffee hour in the kitchen and there were adults talking around me not really paying attention to this 10 year old definitely not thinking she would remember what they said for the next 15 years um, and they were talking about whether or not this was a good idea they were saying you know I think it's important but it might be a little bit disruptive because some of these folks will have a hard time keeping quiet for the whole service and so it might sort of change the feel and what will communion be like we always walk forward but this might take a long time and things will clatter and clank with all the metal and what if it's confusing to the children and all of these things now thank god we didn't let our good manners get in the way of the good news and these folks did join us for worship, and it became immediately clear that our community was all the richer for it, and that we were so much more fully the body of Christ because they were worshiping with us. And those conversations became a distant memory, and I'm pretty sure I am the only one who still remembers them. And so that was a happy ending, but I think we felt it in other ways too, in intimate relationships or in church conversations where we would much rather avoid rocking the boat and so we choose to sweep under the rug the ways that we can hurt each other to sweep under the rug the ways we need help and we're not getting it we choose to keep things conflict free for the sake of good manners whether or not that helps us live into the good news because the gospel calls us to something that is so much deeper than good manners the gospel calls us to inclusion and welcome and love, even if it's messy and even if it flies in the face of cultural expectations. There's perhaps nowhere that we feel that more acutely, more tangibly than we do in the sacrament that we get to celebrate today in communion. When Max and I and whoever else leads communion stands up here, we often say things like, and they will come from east and west and north and south. We say that people are welcome here whether or not they come full of faith or doubt, 
whether or not they've been here before or this would be their very first time. We talk about how this isn't my table or Max's table. It's not the church's or the denomination's table, but that it's Christ's table. It's God's table. And that Jesus desires that anybody who wishes to come would meet him here. In communion, we get to witness and participate in the good news, which runs so much deeper than good manners, that all are welcome, that everybody has a seat at this table. There's no seating chart. There's no honor given to one over another, that we all find a home here at this table. Because at Christ's table, all are welcome and all are included. And an especially tender welcome is extended to those on the margins, those that often feel excluded in other settings, in other communities, those who often feel excluded even here in the church. And it's our job as the church, as the body of Christ, to ask ourselves each and every day with each and every decision that we make, whether or not we're living into this call to welcome, whether or not we are living into this call to inclusion, whether or not we're putting our own seat at the table or putting our own concept of good manners over the truth of the good news. As people of faith, it's our job to make sure that when we stand up here on Communion Sunday and say all are welcome, that everybody feels that and knows that in their very bones and that we'd be willing to throw out good manners if ever they get in the way of the good news. Amen.